Amen. Okay, um, just a quick roadmap for tonight. Uh, as we did last week, we're going to do the lecture, about 25, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll do the group discussion. Uh, most of the questions in the study guide will be tonight, three of the five on the, on the first chapter. I've thrown a few extras in, and that's just going to be the nature of the beast. Uh, the questions in the workbook, study guide, whatever you want to call it, just to prime the pump, get us thinking, and then I'll have some additional ones for us to think about together as we come together to talk about the text. So last time, remember back the many moons ago, we began... Uh, Philippians in earnest. We had surveyed the book together, and I hope you still have that survey chart or you're filling it out because that's a handy chart to go back and refer back to as we continue to study through because we'll get in the nitty-gritty stuff and it helps you to put everything in perspective and context. But we began last time with the opening of the letter, which deals with basically two things. Paul's prayer on behalf of the Philippians, that they would specifically, I think he... Um, in verse 9, he prays specifically that their love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment, and in order that they may approve the things which are excellent, so that they can be blameless until the day of Christ. Um, and that they accomplish this by being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And that's Philippians 1, 8 through 11. We spent the later half of the lecture last time talking about Paul's, basically his personal update. Uh, how it's going for him in prison, and his attitude about being in prison, which can be summarized again in verse 18. Uh, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So the situation is he's in prison, and there's other preachers out there who are trying to cause him distress, trying to make him upset, trying to do whatever there is they're trying to do, by getting, trying to get a bigger name than he has. As you think about Paul, you might call him the, capital T-H-E, evangelist of the church in the first century. He is the one that starts all the churches of Asia and Greece. He is the one that is baptizing more. He is preaching more. The other apostles are doing their own work, but Paul is the main focus of really most of the New Testament historical book of Acts. So, some are thinking that, okay, now he's gone, it's my time to shine. And it's from selfish ambition they go that way. The other group is going, no, Paul's in prison, I need to step up. You know, he taught me the gospel, now it's time for me to be a teacher here in this congregation and teach others. So they have these two groups of people, and Paul basically goes, whether in pretense, whether it's from selfish ambition or it's out of genuine motivation, I'm rejoicing in the fact that the gospel now, instead of being only preached by myself, is being preached by hundreds and hundreds of Christians, probably more so than that. Uh, and so we get there at the end of verse 18, and this I will rejoice. So my Bible, New American Standard, breaks up the thought. Paul begins a new thought at the end of verse 18. Yes, and I will rejoice. This is briefly... This is a brief section outline of what we're going to be covering about. Basically, I've seen three main divisions in, in this later part of chapter 1. Uh, Paul gives his cause for rejoicing. He further expands upon that. He has his little discussion about to live as Christ, his dilemma between life and death. And then I basically put the last part underneath the general heading of live consistent with the gospel because he ends chapter 1 with the admonition. Uh, and really, he's not ending chapter 1 because the thought that's begun in verse 27 is not completed until verse 11 of chapter 2. Uh, again, the chapter breaks here interrupt the thought. So there's an entire thought that he begins in verse 27 and carries through most of chapter 2. Uh, so getting to most of the lecture tonight, and I didn't make it clear last time we talked if you have an observation or comment to be made during the lecture, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, I fully welcome that if I'm blazing past them or you have a question. Uh, so feel free to do that as we talk about these things. So getting off on that first section then, Paul's cause of rejoicing. 
So the first reason he rejoices, we find at the beginning of verse 18, is because that the gospel is being proclaimed. Um, you know, again, just to reemphasize, it would be very natural for a lot of the Christians who have come to know Paul to be very discouraged by him being imprisoned. Uh, those of you who have been at Country Club Road for a long time, it would have been, maybe this is a bad comparison on behalf of Paul, but it would have been like at Hugh in his 25th year of preaching here and all the baptisms that happened going on, that he suddenly gets in prison uh, because the local mayor or whatever doesn't like the things he's saying. And, you know, he say he's the only one that was capable of preaching and teaching. It seemed like, okay, what the, what's the work going to do now? Our, our preacher's gone. And it, that's what his detractors thought was going to happen. Now, in reality, that didn't happen. Really, his imprisonment served as an opportunity for growth for a lot of Christians. And so Paul rejoices in that fact. So here in this next part, yes, I will rejoice in the end of verse 18. Verse 19 gives the reason. Uh, the four there is gar, which is assigning a reason. It's, it's causal in relationship to the previous verse. He is rejoicing because he knows that this, his imprisonment, will turn out for his deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, or of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So, this causal relationship then, he is rejoicing in the fact that, for two reasons. One, the first one is, he knows he has the support of the Philippians. He knows he has their support of prayers, their financial support. They are behind him. They are praying earnestly on his behalf that this will result in his release and so forth. Uh, perhaps this is comparable to the many situations we've become accustomed, not accustomed to, we've been made aware of in the last couple months of brethren either here or abroad who are suffering through various ailments and illnesses. Uh, most recently, Sean Stewart, for example. It is a big comfort and a balm for the people of God to know you have hundreds of Christians behind you praying on your behalf. Uh, and that prayer is effective. Prayer accomplishes much. And so it's a great comfort and a cause for rejoicing for Paul. And secondly, Paul rejoices in that he is rejoicing in the providence of God. And he'll go on to explain a little bit further, but basically as he knows no matter the outcome, life or death, that God's care will be there. And that is a cause for rejoicing in that. So and this is where we get into Paul's dilemma. Excuse me, I did not put this up here. Um, so he exalts, you know, no matter what happens, Christ will be exalted, Christ will be glorified in his body. Um, and this is where we introduce Paul's dilemma. Once they get here. Okay. So we get into verse 21. He summarizes really this whole section of the Scripture in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now he goes on to explain how he feels like he's being torn from two sides here. Verse 22. But if I'm going to live on the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith, so you, that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Excuse me. This dilemma, I doubt, many of us have actually felt. Um, I think very few Christians in the modern age have been able to relate to this, and maybe I'm presumptively speaking on that. Um, but Paul stands as a great example for us of something we should be aspiring to. Um, so on this point, it's interesting, again, um, if I haven't said his name enough in my preaching, um, one of my idols, that's not the right word, um, preaching role models, whatever you want to call it, heroes, uh, Floyd Thompson. Uh, granted, we live, he died decades before, as my dad would say, I was a glimmer in his eye. Uh, but 
that book, book, chapter, and verse that his wife Ruth compiled uh, has been very helpful to me and very encouraging. Uh, we have a copy in the church library. I highly recommend you check it out, look at it. Um, but Ruth relates, and I think this is a man, if I can think of a modern-day Paul that had the same dilemma. It was Floyd Thompson. and She relates this, and I think it's applicable here to help get us in the mindset or help us understand Paul here. She says, one of the last rational statements made by Floyd prior to his death in 1984, and which I hear, heard him repeat several times was, I would like to have about 10 more years to teach. He did not have it. But this emphasizes to our minds his impression of the urgency of the gospel. His compelling motive for living was, also, was so that he could teach others. It is the mark of a dedicated preacher, and I would add to that as the mark of a dedicated Christian. Um, it's amazing to me, again, one of the last rational statements he made. So, again, I believe it was, it was either blood or bone cancer that, that uh, he contracted, which he was able not to survive. But towards the end, he was delirious, so I've been told. And the thing that he kept on repeating was, I just want to teach more people. I just a couple more years to teach more. And I would suggest that's kind of what Paul is feeling here. You know, Roman prison... Paul knows what's on the line. Uh, we're reading through the book of Acts right now. If you're on the five-day Bible uh, reading plan, we've just finished Acts chapter 25 where it talks about how Paul appealed to Caesar and he knows what's on the line. It's a death sentence if it doesn't go his way. And so he has this longing that he would continue on in life so that he could still be of great use to the Philippians. In fact, so much so that... Um, he begins to talk, uh, convince, uh, convinced of this, he is now assured, even though he has this dilemma here in verses 21 through 23, uh, 24, excuse me. In 25, he seems to have objective knowledge, and he knows he will be released. I found that interesting, and I um, found one writer who actually had something pretty interesting to say on that. Trying to find that, excuse me here. Well, at least I thought I included my notes, that's okay. Anyway, let's see. Oh, here it is. So one writer had this to say, it, it, it's interesting about his his conviction here in verse uh, 25. That's what writer adds. He said, in this instance, the need of the Philippian church, Philippians, the Philippian church constitutes the divine call for Paul to go on living, a call to which he cannot say no, and which he accepts with cheerfulness. Again, I think there's a lot of reasons that Paul would have this attitude within the letter. He's talked about the sure hope. Again, biblical hope in this passage here, hope in verse 20, if I understand correctly, is not the wishy-washy thinking what we refer to when we say hope, but is more of the confident expectation that this will happen. And so Paul is expecting he will not be put to shame, that his he will be delivered, and he will be able to return to them again, and so that he may continue in fruitful labor to the Philippians and also to the church as a whole. Let's see here. So on the next third section here, I apologize, I keep forgetting about this. Oh, yes. Um, on the life or death, um, basically, again, the death is not the loss that his opponents think it's going to be. It's, it's actually gain for him, and it's actually a cause for rejoicing for other Christians because it's they're not rejoicing in the fact that this brother's gone, but they're rejoicing in the fact that he's been freed from the shackles of this world, the sin, the toil, the pain, and has gone on to his reward. So the next section is where we get to the admonition um, in verse 27. It says, Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. 
For to you has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So he talks about here then in verse 27, only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Um, ASV, I believe, is preferable here. Let your manner of life be consistent with the gospel. And that's what he is referring to here. Which makes a point here, which I read the R9, I think I want to emphasize here. There can be no correct application of the Word of God. There can be no correct <clears throat> living, no correct, uh, no godly living, no holiness. There can be no application of the text without first a correct understanding of what the gospel teaches. And it's interesting, when you look at Paul's letters, I think of Galatians especially, he talks about mainly, not mainly, he talks about justification. How are we made right with God? That's all the doctrine in that letter. But in the later part of that letter, he talks about marital relationships, slave-master relationships. He talks about godly living. And really, how Paul applies the gospel isn't so much as like, okay, and this verse is how you apply this in your life. It's more of the gospel provides a lens for, to look at the entire world, and that transforms your relationships, your understandings. Um, but that lens, if you want to call it that, can't be properly looked through unless you know how to look through it, unless you understand the core concepts and what the gospel actually teaches. And so while Paul in, in Philippians that really does not deal with a whole lot of, I would say, weighty doctrine. He deals with mainly the, the, the essentials and the first principles of, of Christ and the need to love one another. Um, he's making a point here that conduct ought to match knowledge. Or, you know, orthopraxy can't happen without orthodoxy. You know, understand doctrine and then understand right practice. Um, but anyway, he, he says that for he admonishes to do this so that whether he's freed or still is in prison, he will hear of them at some point that they're standing firm, united to one spirit and mind, and they are striving together for the faith of the gospel. Um, he specifies the gospel again. Uh, he specifies the gospel because again, Paul is dealing with other churches in the in the region, uh, not region churches during this time, such as Galatia that has fallen for a false gospel. Other groups that are being persuaded by false teaching. And so Paul is emphasizing again the pure unadulterated faith that comes from the pure unadulterated gospel. And then he reminds them too to take courage and be encouraged by the fact that they have opposition. And this is something I might be camping and standing on a soapbox here right now, so just rant warning right now. <laughs> there's a lot of talk, and I don't mean necessarily here, just reading online and publications, uh, of lament at the, quote, loss of Christian America. A little side point on that. In order for something to be Christian, in order to lose something, to lose Christian America, it had to first be Christian. So let's get that clarified. Um, but there's a lot of lamenting and angst and anxiety and, oh, the, the culture doesn't like us. It never was supposed to like us. If you're doing your job right as a Christian, I, even, the, even the, a country like this, let's go back around the Civil War. Let's go back around the Civil War, the war question. Um, biblical Christians were not liked. David Lipskin who preached in um, Tennessee, I believe, during the Civil War. The Confederacy sent spies into the congregations to hear what he was preaching. If, they, if he was preaching what they deemed seditious, they were going to string him up. Because David Lipskin held the position that Christians ought not to engage in carnal warfare, which was a very calm position for most of church history. Um, there's a good discussion to be had around that. Um, that's for another class. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to that, but it is a well-respected position that does have biblical merits. Um, 
the spy that was sent in there left the service crying because he said, I don't know if what he was saying was seditious. But what I know was he, that man preached the gospel. So make a little point here. Biblical Christianity, doesn't matter what time you're in, doesn't matter if the culture is Christian-ish or, or not, biblical Christianity doesn't fit in with the world. So when I hear about, when I read articles of lamenting that the, the pushback in this country, I just think about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I think about, you know, for example, Matthew chapter 5, 10 through 12, he talks about, Blessed are you when you are persecuted, and when people revile you for the sake of my name. I look at Acts 5, verse 41, where the apostles rejoice because, quote, they have been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. So I apply this here specifically because I think it fits to our current cultural context or setting. That when Paul says to the Philippians, don't be alarmed by your opponents. Is their opposition to you? That's a sign of destruction for them. It's what John said in the beginning of the Gospel of John. The dark does not, I'm just Brendan Ashby paraphrase, the dark does not like the light because the light exposes the dark deeds of itself, and so it hates the light. So opposition, sign of destruction for them. But Paul said it's a sign of salvation for you Christians, that you are being light, you are being salt in the world. So there'll be a pushback, some. But he also said that this pushback is a blessing in verse 29. For you has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, okay, all Christians get that blessing, but also to suffer for his name's sake. And not only suffer for his name's sake, they're not alone in that, they have a fellowship in that suffering, in that they're experiencing the same conflict which they saw in Paul. And now Paul is going through. Okay, that I think covers the highlights of this portion. Um, so I want to dive in and talk about some of these concepts here. We're going to be coming back to this opposition thing. Um, and again, if you really want these out, the outline, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, there's the verses I was, I'm going to leave that up just real quick as I get a drink of water if you want to write that down. Um, okay. So, getting then to the discussion of these concepts, uh, the first question really deals with, and I'll, I'll put it up in just a second, uh, goes back, re rewinds a little bit in verse 12, it goes through verse 20, so big section there. But Paul has a certain attitude here that we want to think about for a little bit. Let's just start off with how would you describe Paul's attitude uh, in verses 12 through 20? Think of the context. Think of what he's going through. Think of his opponents. Think of what our attitude would be and now contrast that with Paul. And how would you describe Paul? Paul? The glory of God is what matters. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's being accomplished. So I'm going to rejoice. Okay. So Paul the Apostle has his priorities right. For Paul the Apostle, the only thing that matters is the glory of God. And that is being accomplished, so I'm going to rejoice. It doesn't matter if I'm in prison or I'm freed. God is being glorified. How else would you guys describe the Apostle Paul's attitude? Nancy? Hopeful and confident, okay? Yeah, we, I think we see that here in verse 20 um, and verse 19 as well. When? Right, he's being very encouraging despite his circumstances. Um, so, Let's go to the second part then. We've, we've talked about some of these characteristics. How can a person have that same attitude? Or we might actually... Yeah. How can a person have that same attitude? I think a lot... Let's think about... I don't mean to keep on pulling out 2020. But let's think about 2020. It's a very 
comparable situation. Most of us were underneath house arrest, uh, um, whatever you want to call it, lockdown, quarantine, okay? I know I failed the test when it came to that attitude, the attitude here. I got sulky, I got depressed, I was discouraged. Um, so I'm really asking this question for my own benefit here. Like, okay, how, how do I have this attitude? Nancy? Okay, sounds simple, but I assure you it, is, it takes work. So be assured of what you believe, or be confident in what you believe, and trust in the Lord. The assurance, of the, the, the conviction of what I believe, what we believe, I don't think that's ever been, I don't want to say ever, that's rarely the issue. It comes up, it does. It's the trusting part. Uh, we haven't sung it in a while, but there's a hymn book in the, there's, there's a hymn book. There's a hymn in the supplement um, called Wait on the Lord. That's probably the hardest thing we're called to do as Christians, is it not? To wait. Because, you know, when I live in a world where I can order a book off of Amazon and have it delivered directly through my, to my tablet, or within an hour if I really want the print, which I really do want the print, it can be a little challenging when God does not operate on Amazon's, you know, one-day guarantee on delivery. Um, and I don't think we really realize how accustomed we got to instantaneous results in our society until we're forced to wait on God. When? Seven, that's just like the per that's always been really helpful for me. I mean, I, I know you have to do it, you have to rejoice, you have to think about um, mm -hmm. the anxious for nothing, you have to pray. And you, but I just always loved that he would guard my heart and mind. I just I think that's amazing. Yes, so Lynn brings up Philippians 4 uh, 4 through 7 uh, about. Rejoicing, yes, but also praying for God to, to guard our minds, to, um, to cast everything on him. And, and I'm going to make a last comment on that, and we'll move on to the next question. But on that, I guess I'm a big advocate for what I call messy, ugly prayer. <laughs> I call it that because in movies there's, there's pretty criers and there's ugly criers. You, you know what we're talking about. There's people who just do not look good when they're crying. I think sometimes prayer needs to be ugly in that let's not come to God with all the pretense of thou most holy, righteous, and these thousand thines. If you pray like that, that's fine. But when was the last time we actually came to God and actually, you know, instead of saying, well, I'm kind of struggling with this, and, or do we fall on our faces and, and out, outpour everything? Um, something to think about. Um, Paul was definitely one who poured everything he had out to God and both to everyone. Paul, didn't, Paul was an open book. He didn't hide his sins. He fully admitted, like, I was a blasphemer, I was a murderer, I was a violent aggressor. That's all I was. Um, he pours it out to everybody. Anyway, we could probably talk until Christ returns on that point, but this is a very good point. Um, so, Paul talks a lot about life and death here. So how did Paul view life and death? And who or what informed his view of life and death? Or death as a human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So and this is how, this was his mindset. Mm -hmm. so, Life and death are the same if it accomplishes the same goal. Hmm. His goal was to glorify God through Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, how does he go about doing that? Well, in life, he is as evangelistic as he possibly can. Mm -hmm. In death, he's there. Right. He's made it. 
it's when it falls. Right. And if, if you avoid the distractions and just keep your eyes on the front, you have a lot of fun, I think, you would. Yeah. Dave brings up a really good point here. For Paul, you know, it was all about giving God glory. He says it in verse 20. I know that even now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So, in life, he's telling everybody he can. And in death, he's made it. But also Paul had the unique blessing, I would add to that, of he got to die for the cause, as it were. He used his imprisonment when we, when you actually, I'm only bringing this up because I just got done teaching Acts and we're reading through Acts and it's on the mind. The charges brought against him were completely bogus. Well, we saw Paul in Jerusalem and he hangs out with Gentiles and we saw him at the tent temple. Even though we didn't see a Gentile there, he must have brought a Gentile there, so he defiled the temple. And Paul, thanks to his nephew, finds out about the conspiracy to kill him, and so Paul, for his, his life, says, I appeal to Caesar. And that starts a long process of where he will spend the rest of his life bound in chains, but it provides him opportunities to speak to governors, to emperors, to, to soldiers, and, and even though he's probably being marched to his death, He's basically telling everybody he can, hey, do you know about my Lord? Do you know about Jesus? Paul, you had a comment. Oh, I was just going to say that Paul's, Paul's view of life and death looks beyond uh, what's, what we see with our eyes. Right? He's seeing spiritual reality, which is that uh, I'm, I'm not this flesh. Right? This is a tent. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just camping here. And I will, I will move into my permanent residence when I leave this tent. Right. This life is temporary. What I am here is not who I am. There will be a, there's something better waiting for me. Um, I'm going to add one comment to this and we'll move on to the next question. In my mind, too, if you think about Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, having already killed Christians, having been there at the execution of Stephen, the first martyr for the church of, of Christ. He's on his way to do the same, very same things at Damascus. By all accounts, worthy of death. Saul of Tarsus was a dead man, by all accounts. Then that God had every right to strike him dead where he stood. But what happens? God doesn't do that. He intervenes. He sees the risen Christ. And when Ananias is like, uh, Lord, you do know, like, Stephen told you, right, who killed him, right? Like, you, you do know about this. Says, I know, I know. But he's going to find out how much he's going to have to suffer for my name. And I, if I was Ananias, I would still be a little trembling, but like, okay, off I go. And Saul of Tarsus gets converted. The chief persecutor now becomes the chief evangelist. Um, and it's amazing, too, how Paul gets this bad rep of being this crass, hard, rough, all the nasty things people want to say about man. But really, when you read Paul's letters, and you see his heart, and it's not just because he writes most of the New Testament, but he speaks more about grace than the Arab apostle that we have written of. He speaks more about the love of God, the love of Christ, because he more than anyone else knows he was the chief recipient of it. So where I'm going with this is because he has been forgiven much, for him, any day after that is just icing on the cake. I'm alive today. I'm going, to go tell, I'm going to tell somebody about God today. Um, anyway, so now we're going to look at verse 27. His admonition here, the first one we've really gotten to, 
conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? It's a very broad question, but how might we be able to do that? How can we do that? Thank you, Len. Well, you all know my notorious uh, surprises that end up in my PowerPoints. <laughs> anyway, okay. How can we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? Or as the ESV says, how can we live in a manner uh, consistent with the gospel? What was that? Live what it says. Live what it says. No, and this is an ongoing process because when you're a new Christian, you know nothing. And I don't mean that, you know, disparagingly or anything, because that's what I would... I'm still dripping from my baptism, and the preacher comes up to me and says, don't take this the wrong way, but you don't know a whole lot right now, and that's okay. That you're going to learn a whole lot. Everything you learn isn't going to invalidate what you did here today. But as a new Christian, you don't know a whole lot, so you're just focusing more on it's simple things like, okay, I need to read this. You do a lot of reading. You got a lot of what's called dead knowledge, kind of, just facts and figures, and Eventually, you get enough, and we're like, oh, starts clicking. Well, I need to start doing these things. Um, so uh, I would suggest a few things, just because we're a little short on time on this one. Maybe we think about this in the next week. Um, one way we can live in a way that's consistent with the gospel is, I think, right there in verse 27. That when it comes to our brethren when it comes to other Christians, when it comes to the local work, that we need to be committed to standing firm on the doctrine of the gospel, that we need to be firm in one spirit, so same attitude, same unity there, with the same mind or understanding. Um, let me double check that. Um, my Bible has an alternate footnote of with one soul, one mind, and Again, speaks to the unity of the brethren. Uh, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And as David said, it's easier said than done. Um, it takes a lot of work. People don't realize actually how much work it takes to keep a sound congregation sound. Um, how much work it takes to keep a healthy congregation healthy. Uh, because that can go away really quickly. Um, I was just looking at a little document that one of the former elders here wrote, Harry Mann, um, at the 40th anniversary of the start of this work of, in 1990. And it was the, they went the first three years without elders. That was it. After that, an eldership was appointed, and since that time, continuous elders, deacons were uh, sought and men were developed and the congregation was not lacking for good sound teaching and opportunities and Christians who were showing the way it was a group effort it wasn't just the shepherds although they led the charge we're going with this is you know it, it takes a lot of forethought it takes a lot of planning it takes a lot of uh, of willingness um, I, I will say that I've been at congregations where there hasn't been a new convert in decades, and it shows. There have been other congregations where there may not be a whole lot of new converts, but it happens with some frequency. And there's a big night and day difference. Uh, the congregations that continually have new converts, um, or at least have them on with some frequency, they're always reminded of the need for first principles. They're always reminded of, of people, they grow. And you need to give them the room to grow. Um, 
they were always reminded of the importance of going back to what does it say? What does the text say? What does the text say? Instead of relying upon, well, we've always done it this way. So, anyway, I rambled a little bit too much there. Uh, let's see, in the few moments we have left, I'm going to make a... Let's well, skip ahead to the last question. Um, we learned, we've already talked a lot about unity. Does my view of opposition and persecution match Paul's? That's a personal reflection question. And I know for me, maybe this is for you too, how might I develop a more biblical mindset towards persecution and opposition? So, Paul? One thing that's very important to remember when we face opposition is that it's not really about you. The opposition, ultimately, is not to me. The opposition is Christ. Mm -hmm. I should have no enemies. Right. The people who are against me should be against me because they're Christ in Right, so make sure, make sure the opposition isn't because of you, if that makes sense. Make sure it's because of Christ. Um, you know, Paul said in Romans, oh dear, I just had it. I know it's verse 8 of one of the later chapters. Oh, excuse me, Romans 12, verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Again, not easy, but commanded. Um, I have family members that live lifestyles that are completely contrary to the gospel. I still have a loving relationship with them. They can't stand what I believe. I'm like, okay, fine. I love you anyway. And that's hard. And there's, there's difficult conversations sometimes, like, okay, I, I can't participate in that, I can't condone that. Um, but as Paul made the point, make sure that opposition, make sure that pushback is because it's for the cause of Christ, not because of something we've necessarily done or been ugly or something. Because Christ was loving and caring to all he met. And sometimes the loving and caring, when people who should have known better, yeah, they received the stark, rebu the, the harsh rebuke. Um, and that's the key. If, they, if a person should know better, there's, there's calls for a little bit more tougher love, but I'm, I'm tangenting out here. Anyway, we, we touched on some of this at the beginning, um, as I talked about. I would recommend, again, reading Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 5, verses 10 and through 12. Look at the ad to the apostles in the book of Acts. Acts 5 and verse 41 is a good verse there. Um, but, oh, Brett. End of Acts 7 and end of Acts 8. Saul, 7 ends with Saul standing there at uh, the death of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen, as he was martyred. And then in 8, you read how people, because of Saul's persecution, the people were scattered. While the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, the people were scattered. They didn't hide. They went out and... You know, they didn't shirk back and hide back from everyone. They scattered, and what they do? Start talking about Christ. Right. You know, uh, Jerusalem wasn't an option anymore. Okay, we're going to go next door. And, and that really should be the attitude, too. Is we can't encounter somebody that really is this pushed back, whatever it is, really does not like the message. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm going to go to your neighbor. I'm going to go to your brother. I'm going to go to your sister. Um, and I will say, too, don't write off that person. What if Ananias just completely wrote off Saul of Tarsus? Now we, okay, yes, I know divine appointments and interventions, all that stuff with Saul of Tarsus, but let's play pretend real quick. What if Ananias completely wrote off Paul? You know, think about a world that would exist without Paul the Apostle. Um, anyway. So, preview of coming attractions. Uh, next week we begin chapter 2. We're not beginning a new thought, actually. We're continuing the thought that Paul has begun here of encouraging the Philippians to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Uh, chapter 2, um, he begins with wanting to convey them the great struggle he is 
in on behalf of them and the brethren Laodicea, um, even though they haven't witnessed it. And he's doing so that they may be encouraged. But then we see this great, great poem about the excellencies of Christ. Excuse me. I said some things that were correct, but for Colossians, not Philippians. Excuse me. No, your Bible isn't messed up, as this Brendan can't read and can't turn pages tonight. Anyway, chapter 2 is all about this great poem about Christ and his, his taking on the heart of a, you know, the form of man, being a servant, showing the way of how excellent service is done on behalf of us. So we're going to be spending a lot of time on that. Uh, I believe... Yeah, we're going to do the first 18 verses next week. Um, we're kind of breaking right there. We'll get, we'll get to that point, and then the, we'll deal with the later half, chapter 2, week after that, Lord willing. Uh, but with that, we're going to kind of cap things off. And uh, just a couple announcements, and then, uh, well, one, just a couple reminders, and then Russ will dismiss in a word of prayer. Again, if you're new here or need your photo updated, Chuck Miller will have his camera Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Please see him about that. If you don't know who Chuck Miller is, just ask me or the elders, and we can show you who Chuck is, and we'll get those photos taken. Uh, reminder, Northside will be having a VBS uh, at the end of June, 21st to 25th, uh, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. There will be an adult class this year. There is a flyer with more information and contact info uh, for the organizers and the lobby. Um, and I don't have anything else. So, Russ, would you lead us in the word of prayer? Jehovah, Father on high, we come before you in prayer, asking you to be with us as we go into the world after our Bible study today, that you would be with us and guard us and to direct us and help us in our endeavors as we strive to live more Christ-like each day of our life. We love you, our Father in heaven, and we pray that you'd be with us through the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior. Amen.